Welcome to Duluth First United Methodist Church. We are located in Gwinnett County, a half mile east of historic downtown Duluth. We are a congregation that believes in relationships. Quite simply, we seek to nurture our relationship with God and with others through weekly worship, small groups, and fellowship. Each Sunday, we offer traditional worship in the sanctuary at 8.30 and 11 a.m. and a contemporary service in Hinton Hall at 11 a.m. Here at Duluth First UMC, all are welcome whether it is in our weekday preschool, children's ministries, youth groups, adult groups, or our mission ministries, we invite you to find your place. We would truly love to have you here with us. Good morning and welcome to worship at Duluth First United Methodist Church. It is delightful to see all of you here today. It's glorious outside and just as glorious inside. I hope that you will take a minute now to stand and greet those who are seated around you and be sure and wave to the folks who are joining us online. have handed out the attendance pads and if you would please sign in pass it down the row and when it makes it to the end of the aisle if you don't mind passing it back and you can note the names of those folks who are seated near you if you're joining us online please click on the link to let us know that you've been a part of today's worship service at the end of the worship service we sing the hallelujah chorus and if you would like to sing with the choir there are copies on each side of the choir loft here and the tenors and basses go this way and the sopranos and altos go that way. I had to look for a minute to know what was happening here, but I think I got that right. But we'll help you find this place. We want to let you know that it's time to register for three different things, three different things that are going on. And those are Vacation Bible School, which, begin, which is June the 24th through the 28th. Make sure you register so that you get all the goodies that go along with that. 
Christian Beginnings, our preschool and kindergarten program here at the church is now accepting registration for the 24-25 school year. Hard to say that. And then we're also having a blood drive on the 17th of this month. You can read about those things in your Sunday supplement. You can check out everything out online. And our uh, website is DuluthUMC.org. Now let us prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of God.
Would you please find the call to praise that is listed in your order of worship? We will remain <coughs> seated. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah.
believe, to, aff and to affirm what you believe by reciting the Apostles' Creed found in your order of worship. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Oh, <laughs> 
Good morning, my name is Olivia Whitlock, and I would like to highlight our Sunday night youth gathering for this week's ministry moment. Our regular Sunday night youth gatherings meet from 5.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. in the Youth Center, also known as the Fish Tank. Sunday night youth gatherings begin with a great time of fellowship over dinner and games, followed by worship, a message, and small group time to help us grow in our faith together as a community. We also have Sunday nights when we, go, when we serve together or go off campus for fun activities. We thank you for your faithfulness and generosity. All these things are only possible because of your regular giving to the general budget. We also thank our great, amazing youth volunteers, I mean adult volunteers, for journeying with us week in and week out. If you would like to get information on how you can serve in our youth ministries, I invite you to speak with Min Lee, the Director of Youth Ministries. There are many ways you can serve and we have a place for you. We thank you for your faithfulness and generosity. Our ushers are coming forward to receive our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. If you are worshiping with us online, there is a link that you may click to make your gift. Let us pray. What a joy to see youth growing in the faith. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to share in this ministry through our giving. Amen.
I would like to invite the kids to join me up front for the children's message. and happy Easter. It is nice to see you here, whether you're sitting next to me or joining us online. Thank you for being here and happy Easter, everyone. I brought something that I wanted to show you. Who can tell me what this is? A caterpillar. How many of you have seen a caterpillar in your yard? They're cute and fuzzy little guys, aren't they? Yeah, tons of them, good. All right, let me show you something else. Ooh, my back tricks. What's this? Oh, wow. I thought it was a cocoon, but what did you call it? Chrysalis, what a smart group you are. <laughs> you go to school, that's great to hear. <laughs> Okay, well, I was just going to call it a cocoon, okay? So it's a cocoon or a chrysalis, and who lives inside of that? The caterpillar. It's like a little home for the caterpillar, doesn't it? All right? When the chrysalis or the cocoon can't hold that caterpillar anymore, what happens? You are the smartest group of kids. It's a monarch butterfly. <laughs> right, right. We'll talk about that the next time I'm up here. <laughs> okay, it turns into a butterfly. And do you know why? I love talking about this is because once the caterpillar turns into a butterfly, it's like a new life. And that is what we're celebrating this Easter morning is new life. New life. Because in the Bible, remember when they killed Jesus, where did they put his body? In a tomb. And what did they roll in front of that tomb? a huge stone, and then they thought it wasn't good enough that maybe somebody would come and get Jesus out of there, so they sealed it extra tight. And then, in three days, what happened? He did, he has new life. The tomb couldn't hold him anymore, just like the cocoon couldn't hold the caterpillar. So it is new life. So that's what we're celebrating this morning. Jesus' new life who gives us new life, joy and hope and a lot of love in our heart. Okay? I have a little something for you at the end of our prayer that is going to remind you about our little time together this morning. When you leave, I want you to look outside at the butterflies Notice all those that are in the front yard, and when you're outside playing this spring or summer and you see a butterfly, remember, new life, just like Jesus gave us new life, okay? All right, parents, I promise you the little goodie that they're going home with is 100% parent approved. There is no C-A-N-D-Y in the back. Again, you're a smart group. 
<laughs> All right, let's say our prayer together. Put your prayer hands. Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for butterflies. Thank you for Easter morning. Amen. Our scripture is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they've laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bit down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. 
Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not touch me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. There were two neighboring families The neighbors, one family had a pet bloodhound and the other family had a pet rabbit in a cage in their backyard. And the family with the rabbit one day said to the family with the bloodhound, could you watch our house while we're on vacation? We're gonna be gone for a couple of weeks. The family with the bloodhound said, sure we will. So a few days went by, but then the next day, the bloodhound brought to the door of his home In his mouth was that rabbit, dead as a doornail, all muddy and dirty and wet. And the family said, oh, what are we going to do? So they put their heads together, and this is what they decided to do. They washed the corpse of the rabbit, got it all clean and white again. They blew it with a blow dryer, and they went to the backyard of their next-door neighbor, and they put it back in the cage. And when the family of the pet pet rabbit got home from vacation they came over to the house of the family of the bloodhound they said did you while we were gone did you see anything strange going on around the rabbit's cage and the family of the bloodhound said no we didn't see anything strange he's still in there isn't he and they said that's just it right before we went on vacation he died and we buried him we can't figure out how he got back in the cage The family with the bloodhound was, was doing a pretty poor job of trying to resuscitate or give life to a corpse. I tell you this morning that Jesus was not brought back to life. Lazarus was brought back to life. I want you to understand the difference. Lazarus was resuscitated. Jesus brought Lazarus and said, come out of the tomb, and told his friends to unbind him from those mummy clothes. But Lazarus was still going to die. Jesus has not been resuscitated. He's been resurrected, never to die again, living forever. There's a difference between being resuscitated and being resurrected. Jesus is resurrected. That's why we sing hallelujah. Look at the linen wrappings. When Lazarus comes out of the tomb, he's still all bound in those mummy wrappings, and Jesus says, unbind him. But when the disciples discover the tomb, Jesus is not there, only the linen wrappings neatly laying there. The good news is not that we can be resuscitated. When that happens, when a person is brought back and they seem to be dead or near death, that's a wonderful thing, but that's not the good news. The good news is that we can be resurrected, never to die again. That's good news. In John chapter 20, there are four people mentioned by name, who were among those who encountered Jesus after the resurrection. One of them is Thomas, who appears just after our text today. But each of these four persons experienced Jesus' resurrection differently, and that's good news also, that four different people experienced Jesus' resurrection differently, because we're all different people. Often we experience frustration at not being treated as different people, as being lumped together, as being treated like a number. That's frustrating. Being lumped in with 
other groups just automatically. Old people are crotchety. Teenagers are irresponsible. Neither of those is true for many, many individuals. I always hated it in school when the whole class got punished for something one student did. And we hear generalizations about genders. Men are messy. Women talk too much. And generations themselves, millennials are this or that, boomers, baby boomers are this way or that way. God doesn't treat us that way. God created us as individuals, loves us as individuals, and relates to us as individuals. We are one in Christ as we gather today to celebrate the resurrection, but we're different. God made us that way. We're not mass-produced like toy soldiers. God relates to us, each of us, according to our own unique personality, our own unique needs. And here in John 20, I think you can see that. You can see in these four people's experience of the empty tomb and the risen Christ. First, look at John, the other disciple, the way John the writer states it himself, or the disciple whom Jesus loved. After hearing from Mary that the body was gone, he got there first ahead of Peter, but he didn't go in. John was probably faster, younger than Peter, but he's deferring. He's quiet and reserved. He's not a leader per se. He let Peter go into the tomb first once Peter arrived. And after Peter had gone in, John did go in, and he saw the empty linen wrappings, and he believed. Not just that the body was gone, not that perhaps Jesus' body had been stolen. He believed that Jesus had been resurrected. Not revived, not resuscitated, resurrected. He didn't fully understand, but he began to understand the Scripture, as all of the disciples would as time passed after the resurrection. John was perhaps the one closest to Jesus all along, at least from John's own perspective the intimacy that John felt with Jesus. And then there's Peter, the leader, the bold one, zealous, the one who had pledged to Jesus before Jesus' death when it appeared that death was imminent and the, the authorities were closing in. Peter was the one who said to Jesus, even if everybody else deserts you, I will not. And then he denied even knowing Jesus three times later in the courtyard of the high priest as Jesus was being interrogated and beaten. Peter's the first to go into the tomb. He sees the linen wrappings, but he doesn't do anything yet. He and John, according to this scripture, simply return separately to their own home. The sense is that nobody knows what to do right now. Jesus himself has yet to appear to either Peter or John. John sees the empty tomb and the linen wrappings, and he believes. Peter, we don't know what's going on inside Peter. The risen Christ will encounter them later in the upper room and again by the Sea of Galilee, but right now all they know is that Jesus' body is gone from the tomb. John believes, but imagine Peter, so bold in his vow to Jesus, then so quick to deny him. Now Peter is guilt-ridden, confused, emotional. What must be running through Peter's head right now? He will have to meet Jesus one-on-one -on -one many days later by the Sea of Galilee. Jesus will confront and forgive him and give him the command, feed my sheep. But now on this first Easter, later that day in the evening in the upper room, Jesus appears to Peter and John and the rest of the disciples, everybody except Thomas. Thomas wasn't there. And when the other disciples tell Thomas that they have seen Jesus risen from the dead, Thomas says, what? No, I don't believe you. I mean, I'd have to put my hand in the wounds to believe what you're telling me. Then eight days later, Jesus appears to them again, and Thomas is with them. 
And Jesus says to Thomas, here, put your hand. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. God meets his individual need, Thomas's. Thomas is skeptical. Thomas is a good representation of the 21st century in that regard. The risen Christ relates to Thomas uniquely. And then there's Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of John tells us the most among these four about Mary Magdalene. Aren't we often a lot like Mary? Seeing Christ, but not knowing that it's Christ that we're looking at. Mary is so overwrought with grief, she can't believe even when she does see Jesus. Her personality is different from John's. He believes right away. For Mary, what the empty tomb means is not resurrection. It means theft. We need to find the body. Where have they taken it? She wants to give him the respect of the anointing that they did for the dead. They've taken him out of the tomb. That's what she reports to the disciples. She sees the stone rolled away, doesn't go in and runs and immediately reports the theft. And even when two angels appear and speak to her, she hasn't changed in this perspective. Even when the risen Christ himself appears to her, she doesn't believe. And he speaks to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Even then, Jesus' voice does not stir faith in Mary Magdalene. She thinks it's the gardener. Her first inclination when she sees and hears him is to think, maybe this guy knows where the body is. Please, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. Mary is crying. She's, Jesus is standing there and speaking to her, and she doesn't recognize him. Finally, Jesus says, Mary. And then the light breaks through. Only when Jesus calls her by name does she recognize him. And she immediately goes to hug him. Rabboni. He says, don't hold on to me. And John, the gospel writer, is giving a word to the early church, particularly those first followers of Jesus. You have to let go of the earthly Jesus, the Jesus you've known. You have to begin wor worshiping the risen Lord. You'll learn more through this spiritual relationship. Mary's belief in the resurrection would come about when she recognized that Jesus' physical leaving was necessary for him to be spiritually present eternally. Jesus had said to the disciples, it's better for you that I go to the Father. And they'll begin to understand that later, Mary and the others. And just as Jesus will later relate to John and Peter and Thomas as different individuals, so now he relates individually to Mary, who, don't miss this, is the very first person to see Jesus, Mary Magdalene. He says to her, don't hold on to me, because Mary has to recognize that he's no longer just teacher and friend. He's Lord. That's different from what he said to Thomas. He says to Mary, don't hold on to me. To Thomas, he says, here, put your hands in the wounds. Because Thomas needed to know it was really Jesus' flesh and blood. Mary will learn that she is now living in the post-resurrection age that we all live in now. Jesus is now glorified and available not only to Mary and the other first followers, but also to the world. And she and they can't hold on to Jesus. 
He's more than their friend and rabbi, and their purpose now is to share him with the rest of the world. He is Lord, not just teacher, not just rabbi. He's not to be held on to. He is to be worshiped. He is the Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus is the most significant event ever. It makes a bigger difference in the universe than any other event that has occurred, is occurring, or will occur. It took the early followers of Jesus a while to realize its significance. The earthly Jesus is gone, but as he had promised, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, is here. The completion of God's kingdom had begun, and the process continues now toward the completion of God's kingdom. And today, we're closer to that than ever before in history. That's good news as well. The risen Christ is with us. Mary Magdalene, the first witness. She's the first to proclaim the good news. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't John. It wasn't Thomas. It was Mary Magdalene, the practical one, the one who doesn't even recognize him when he's standing in front of her. Peter and John went home. Later, they all realized their experience of the risen Christ, and they all began to share the good news. Peter preaching at Pentecost when so many joined the early church. John writing this gospel that we have before us, probably 70 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. Thomas also witnessed to Christ. He shared his experience of Christ with others. Everyone who encounters the risen Christ witnesses to others of that encounter in some way depending on their personality. We have no records of any sermons preached by Mary Magdalene, but no witness of any preacher is more powerful than the first witness that Mary Magdalene gave. I have seen the Lord. God reveals God's self to each of us differently. We witness to that experience differently. Don't feel like you have to meld your witness to the form of what someone else is telling you it should be. God has created us with different personalities. Personality matters. Some of us are like John. We're quiet. Some of us are like Peter, bold. Some of us are like Thomas. We're skeptical. Some of us are like Mary, so practical that even when Jesus is there in the ordinary, we can't see his sacredness. Some of us are completely different from any of them. Each of us is unique. No one else on earth is exactly like you. God knows that. And God gets through to you or will get through to you in a way that's different from the way God gets through to anyone else. We're not like gingerbread cookies. We're not cut from the same mold. And God knows that. After all, God made us. God knows that we don't perceive the world exactly the same way. We don't feel or understand everything the same way. And God gives each of us the unique individual attention that we need, as he did with John and Thomas and Peter and Mary. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And the people of those days knew that the good shepherd knows each of his sheep by name. If you feel like you haven't experienced the risen Christ, it may be that, like Mary, you're having a hard time seeing through your tears. Like Mary, you may be looking right at Christ, you just haven't recognized him yet. Or maybe you're like Thomas, you can see, but you're not sure what you're seeing is real. Listen. Keep your ears, your mind, your heart, your eyes open. Sooner or later, you'll hear the risen Christ call you by name. Mary Magdalene said, I have seen the Lord. But it happened differently for Mary from the way it happened for John. It happened differently for Thomas from the way it happened for Peter. Just so it happens differently for you and for me. In some way, uniquely designed for your own unique personality, the risen Christ will call you by name, 
And then what a joy to join Mary and John and Peter and Thomas and others seated around you here today. What a joy to join in proclaiming Christ is risen. What a joy to share this glorious good news in whatever way God leads you to share it. Christ is risen. We have life forever. Let us pray. O God, who hears our call before our lips move, who answers our call before it is raised, we praise you for being present among us, for being present to us. Today, Christ has risen and revealed himself to all of us, even those who have denied knowing him. This grace of yours, O God, how hard it is to understand and how hard it is to accept. You engage each of us in a way that is unique to our needs. You treat us as individuals, giving each of us what we need. There are many places today that need the hope of that resurrection. We pray for those in Ukraine, in Gaza, in Baltimore, as they cope with darkness. We pray for those listed on our prayer list and those we name in our hearts. Encourage us as Easter people to raise our unique voices together to help, to comfort, to support each other. Hear your people as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The day of resurrection is our sending hymn. It's number 303 in the hymnal. We want to invite you to join the church. If you're not already a member, please consider coming forward during the last verse of this hymn to join the church. I'll meet you here at the altar. If you've been a member of a Christian church in the past, tell me the name of that church and we'll transfer your membership from there to here. If you've never been a member of a Christian church, but you've accepted Jesus Christ as your savior and want to follow Jesus as your Lord, tell me that when you come and we'll receive you on profession of faith. Those of you who are worshiping online, you can see on the screen right now, the phone number and the email for the Reverend Beth Shugart. Please contact her about joining the church. You're invited. Please rise and body your spirit as we sing the day of resurrection. <clears throat>
Please turn to 38 in your hymnal, and hopefully you will see a response on the screen as we're pleased to welcome into our fellowship John Pulliam and Rick Weaver. They're joining by transfer of their membership from Lawrenceville First United Methodist Church. They've uh, been to Information Station with Beth and have been worshiping with us, and John actually was one of our readers at the Good Friday service this past Friday night. I'm going to ask them simply to take their vow for supporting this local church, and then your response, congregation, will be the one printed in the bulletin because it has the actual uh, wording that includes our witness, and hopefully you will find yours on the screen if you're worshiping with us online. John and Rick, as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? And if you will, answer by saying, I will. Members of the household of God, I commend John and Rick to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members of the household of God, we ask that I'm going to ask John and Rick to remain up here briefly after the benediction and the hallelujah chorus so that you can come and tell them how glad you are that they've chosen to make us their church home. Now let us go in peace and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen.